Hi, I'm David Dean Hastings, and today we're talking about broadswords. The term broadsword is a backwards-looking term, meaning a general category of broad-bladed weapons mostly associated with the knights of medieval Europe. There were different sizes. There were ones that you held in one hand, sometimes called an arming sword. There were ones that were bigger, uh, that were called a hand and a half, or bastard sword, the ones that we commonly use in class at AMDA. And then there were the larger broadswords called a two-hander or a zweihander. We're going to mostly focus on the hand and a half uh, broadsword or bastard sword, sometimes also just commonly called the long sword. Uh, and I have one here with me. Um, if you don't have one at home, most people don't, that's okay. You can use a long-handled umbrella or a broomstick handle. Uh, any of those will do just fine. Let's talk about grip. Um, if you take a look right here, uh, if you compare this to the parts of the sword that we know in second semester, uh, the rapier, you've got the uh, pommel right here, you've got the handle right here. Notice that there's no knuckle guard. And then you have the two protrusions on the other side. And in rapier, we call that the quillon, but here we're just gonna call it the cross guard because it very much resembles a crucifix in shape. Um, and then you have, of course, the piece that's closest to the hilt, which is the fort, and then you could say the mid blade, and then you could say that the end furthest away from the handle is called the foible, even though this is not any uh, less strong than the fort in its width and construction, we're still going to say that the piece that is longest, uh, furthest away from my hand is still the foible. So, grip. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take my dominant hand and I'm going to place my dominant hand just underneath the cross guard and I'm going to align my fingers that if I extend my index finger forward, it's in the same direction as my cross guard. What I don't want to do is have it perpendicular or any other angle. I want it in the same direction as the cross guard. That's my dominant hand. I'm going to take my non-dominant hand and place it directly underneath. And if I extend both index fingers, they're both pointed in the same direction. I don't want them at perpendicular or 180 degrees from each other. I want them in the same direction. Now, with the hand and a half, I don't have a lot of handle on the other side, so I may want to choose to have my hands nice and tight against each other, so I have both hands on the sword. This sword can be wielded with either two hands or one hand in some cases, so I want those kind of right up against each other here. But again, if I extend those index fingers out, they're pointed in the same direction. So let's talk about the stance. The stance is very much like our rapier stance. I've got that lead foot, toes pointing forward, my trailing foot off at an angle. My stance is nice and wide and low. I need to be connected to the earth. The broadsword is a momentum-based weapon. I need to be grounded in order to move that heavy sword through the air and use momentum in my favor. I don't want to stop and then redirect that energy. It's going to take too much time. It's going to take too much energy from me. The more I can keep it in motion, the better it is for me. Now, I'm in that grip that we talked about and I want the sword in front of me. Notice that the pommel is in front of my left hip, which is back. Right? I, it'll feel better. I want that point of the sword pointed at my opponent, which right now is the camera. Notice I don't want my guard over here. That's just inviting them to come in. I want it pointed in front so it's coming across my body diagonally toward my own image or my partner or my opponent. And I'm pretty much saying, if you want me, you have to get through my sword. Let's talk about guards. So in the late 15th century, a fight master named Hans Tallhofer wrote a manual called Fechtbook. In it, there are a lot of different illustrations of things that we can use as a guard. Um, we're going to talk about four of them right now. Are there other guards throughout history and in different cultures? Absolutely. But Hans Tallhofer's manual, Fechtbook, seems to have a lot of what we now refer to as German longsword. So our first guard is called Vamtag, or from the roof. 
my broadsword is up and in front of me, but nice and high in the air. It has got a lot of potential energy to come down onto my opponent's head. Also, there is another version of Vomtag that kind of rests on the shoulder and it could spring forward onto my opponent. And that is called Vomtag. There is another stance called Ox very much like the animal, the ox, with the horns, this comes up and points downward at my opponent. Now, certainly this looks like it could come downward with a thrusting action, but in reality, this winding action of pushing and pulling then can generate a lot of force from that position of ox. So I can have ox with my left foot forward, or I can have ox with my right foot forward. Again, the winding action coming around can develop a lot of momentum. There is another guard called flug, or the plow. This is very much like the stance that we started with, with the uh, blade out in front of me, me being nice and wide, and again, having the blade between me and my opponent, nothing fancy. If I change position, I might want to turn the pommel onto the other hip. If I pass forward, I want to turn that onto the other hip right here. But the point of the sword is still trained on my opponent. So this position out in front is called flug, or the plow. The last German guard that we're going to talk about is called Albert, translated as the fool. My sword is behind me almost, or beside me. This giving the illusion that I have dropped my guard, when in reality, I can step forward and have an upward slash right there. So Albert has this illusion of me not protecting myself. Meanwhile, I am cocked and ready to come forward. Throughout history, there have been many different fight masters writing different manuals and using many different guards. The English had their own uh, names for guards, the Germans had theirs, the Japanese had theirs, um, but they all kind of translated into a very similar uh, style. Um, the English had uh, something called the roebuck, which was very much like ox. It is an animal with horns threatening their opponent in a downward fashion. So there's a lot of similarity through the different uh, fight masters. If I had a piece of advice for beginning broadsword students, it would be this. Keep your stances low, keep your stances wide, connect with the earth, ground yourself. Use your core to move the weapon through the air. Again, this is a momentum-based weapon. I want to use my stability and my base to move the weapon through the air. And once the object is in motion, have it stay in motion as much as possible. The less you have to redirect that energy, the more energy you will have to finish the fight. All right then, be well.